and welcome to State of the Economy. Uh, we are fresh from Be Brexit. Uh, so we thought today we will discuss the way the global economy has been fragmenting uh, since the big financial crisis of uh, 2008, which, which shook the world. Uh, so on the one hand, we see a fragmentation of uh, global uh, economic uh, arrangements. Uh, on the other hand, uh, from India's perspective, we are also seeing uh, a, a strong uh, consolidation of uh, uh, military uh, security cooperation uh, with the global powers uh, like the US. So uh, how are these two developments to be viewed and, uh, and how, are they, uh, how are they placing India, uh, India's evolving uh, geo strategic, uh, geo-economic and geopolitical uh, objectives uh, is what we are here to discuss today. And uh, we have with us uh, former Foreign uh, Secretary, uh, Mr. Sham Saran, uh, who is uh, uh, one of the most uh, highly regarded uh, uh, specialists uh, uh, on uh, uh, geo strategy. Uh, he is uh, the chairman of uh, research and information system uh, uh, at present. Uh, welcome to our show, uh, Mr. Sham Saran. So we've had this uh, discussion with you earlier, uh, but it was before Brexit. Uh, it's a continuing dialogue, uh, this fragmentation of uh, the global uh, economic uh, arrangements. Now, uh, how do you see that in the context of Brexit, as also uh, in the context of India's attempts to to do bilateral deals with the big powers like the US, uh, etc. Well, as you mentioned that uh, the current uh, series of developments which have led in a sense to Brexit uh, really originate from the global financial and economic crisis uh, of 2007-2008. Uh, because that unleashed really across the uh, global uh, economy uh, forces and very adverse forces which are still playing themselves out. Uh, as you know, uh, the uh, advanced countries like uh, the United States, um, Europe, uh, for the last uh, several years now have uh, been uh, engaged in you know, quantitative easing, um, they have uh, resorted to very unconventional uh, fiscal and uh, monetary, monetary uh, policies. policies. Mm -hmm. And uh, these have still not been able to overcome the continuing economic stagnation uh, in these even countries. Currency policies, right? uh, even currency policies. Uh, even currency policies. And you also have uh, a situation where as a result of this economic stagnation, uh, there are obviously uh, political and uh, social consequences. Uh, one of the major consequences really has been uh, the very high rates of unemployment uh, that you find across in fact, especially youth unemployment, world. exactly exceeding 30 40 percent in much of Europe, right? Some in, in some countries, uh, very, very high proportion. And uh, you also, at the same time, I think one of the things which we perhaps don't see clearly is the psychological impact uh, of uh, what has happened uh, in the aftermath of the financial and economic which is crisis, probably fueling these nationalist protectionist right. sentiments. Yeah. The sense that globalization of the last uh, so many decades has actually uh, led to the impoverishment of the middle class uh, in the advanced uh, economies, that globalization has been of benefit only to a small a global elite, you know, which is interconnected, you know, the London market or the New York market, the, you know, Tokyo market, these are all interconnected, but somehow or the other, you know, somehow delinked from the, what is called the uh, main, main street uh, economy. Uh, so this contradiction is what is really at play and, and, and uh, I'm not in a sense surprised. Uh, what, no wonder uh, the Brexit leader's first statement uh, was that this is a vote against big business, merchant bankers. So he was, he was actually targeting the financial elite. Yes, I, I mean, uh, as, as you would have seen in Brexit, uh, uh, it is almost like uh, the rest of, uh, rest of the UK voting against London. You know, uh, why? Because London represents precisely that uh, elite which has really been the chief beneficiary mm -hmm. of the forces of uh, globalization. And I think uh, countries uh, in the uh, Western world have not really been able to come to terms with the passing of an era 
where not only in terms of uh, economic capabilities, but also in terms of ideological, you know, sort of ascendance, uh, the West was ruling the world in a sense, you know, the so-called was Washington consensus. Yeah. Uh, now, the Washington consens uh, consensus really lies in tatters, yeah. you know. So, nothing has taken its place. And the challenge to globalization comes from the heart of a uh, uh, exactly. country which began the process of globalization. Exactly. And yeah. doing, in, in, in perhaps a much more acute fashion, the, the kind of things that were, they were preventing uh, developing countries from resorting to when the developing countries were facing uh, such crisis. For example, this quantitative easing uh, would not have been something that would have been countenanced, uh, say when the 1997 uh, economic uh, crisis took place in Asia. Uh, so the ones who set the rules of the game, in a sense, for the global economy, for global trade, have today become the worst violators of that uh, order. And even in terms of, say, protectionism, yeah. I mean, you, there was a recently a uh, report from the WTO that despite the consensus decision which was taken at the G20, mm -hmm. that there would be no uh, sort of protectionist uh, sure. measures which would be adopted by the G20 countries, but in, in reality, there's fact, been a lot of, exactly. in fact, there's a piece of data which suggests, Mr. Saran, that uh, 1,500 stealth right. protectionist right. measures right. have been put in place exactly. in the last six, seven exactly. years. Exactly. So, what I'm trying to say is that those who actually upheld a certain um, economic uh, philosophy, uh, those who actually were responsible for running the global and globalized economy, today are, are the ones who are skeptical about its benefits mm. and who are, as I said, perhaps the ones who are really in the forefront of undermining some of the very basic pillars uh, of that globalized. Uh, how, how should, uh, uh, Mr. Saran, how should India view this, these developments? Uh, India is also in a, very, uh, in a very peculiar situation where it is also having to review many of its trade arrangements uh, uh, with ASEAN, with Thailand, uh, comprehensive economic cooperation agreements. Lately, uh, I read in the papers in the Business Standard where you write a column yesterday, it said that uh, the RCEP, which is a huge trade block which India is part of uh, in under negotiation, India is skeptical about that also because India feels that China is using uh, that huge trade block to have uh, market access into India and uh, India is not gaining any reciprocity. That's the Indian position uh, in terms of movement of people, which is our main uh, uh, competitive advantage. So, so where does where does India stand in terms of uh, making these, uh, uh, getting into these ar arrangements uh, which would push India's economic uh, growth, exports, uh, or bring welfare gains to India generally? So, where, where is India positioned? Let me let me uh, first make the point that uh, engaging uh, in uh, international trade, uh, being open to foreign capital flows, uh, to technology flows. Uh, this is indispensable to India's development prospects. Uh, so, so this part of globalization a, process cannot be reversed? Uh, I cannot see that being reversed, yeah. you know. But I think India uh, would certainly, uh, in normal circumstances, would uh, perhaps benefit most from a global, rule-based, multilateral, order as far as the trade and so investment. You're talking about the WTO. Concerned. The WTO, global regimes are much better for uh, countries uh, like India, which are not quite at the moment at the high table or the side of the table where the rules are being written. I mean, we are a very small part of global trade. Don't forget. I mean, our... our so we are, we are rule takers, generally. Generally speaking, we are rule takers, although we may say we don't acknowledge that, but actually that is the, the case. So what is our challenge? Our challenge is to see, can we in some way try to still uphold and promote that international rule-based order on the one side? And if that is not possible, is there some way that we can use some of these regional trade arrangements or bilateral trade arrangements in order to get an expanded market for uh, Indian products, not only in terms of exports, but also access to technology and high technology products 
for India's uh, de de development. Mm -hmm. So this is something which uh, is a question of, you know, how do you uh, negotiate? Now, the problem that you mentioned, say, with the RCEP, part of the reason why India is seen as being defensive, uh, by being also almost like an obstructionist, is that, you know, India is not really articulating its very justifiable positions uh, persuasively in the public domain. There is really no reason why India should not be seeking access for its uh, services or products in which it has comparative advantage. After all, what is the principle of international trade? Yeah. It is that let countries work on the basis of their comparative advantage. Where do we have comparative advantage? We have comparative advantage skills in services, yeah. uh, in, in terms of skills, in terms of, say, products, for example, in pharmaceuticals. Now, these are precisely the areas where we face not so much tariff barriers as non-tariff barriers. Yeah. Now, we must make our case known and we should argue uh, our case. What happens is that a number of countries use this sort of perception of India as an obstructionist in order to put pressure on us. Uh, you know, I faced the same thing in the climate change negotiations. You know, we were constantly shown as being the country which is, you know, blocking consensus. We were not the ones who were blocking consensus. It was the countries, the big countries who were blocking consensus. So it is partly a question of, you know, how good and effective your public diplomacy is. But I would certainly say this, that uh, we cannot turn our backs uh, on international trade. We can't turn inward. Uh, yeah. We cannot turn our backs in terms of, you know, what is going to remain and going to be a fact of life that is a globalized economy. Not because of what countries are doing uh, themselves in terms of policies, but because of the march of technology. Sure. You know, I mean, we are, whether we like it or not, we are a very interconnected uh, world today. I mean, what you see is a reaction uh, to this new world. And, you know, you would have seen, uh, just uh, if I could just point out, you would have seen, if you look at the voting analysis in Brexit, mm -hmm. the overwhelming majority of people, voters who are in the 18 to 25, 25 to 35 they years of age category, remain. they are the ones who have voted to remain. It is the older people, you know, who have actually uh, swung the swung the vote Possibly in favor Younger of people are most post sovereign in the thinking because they are looking. I mean, they are part of the new generation. They are part of the new world. So they see that this kind of fragmentation will actually work against their future prospects. Despite the fact that unemployment is pretty high amongst those categories, yet they see the future in terms of that more interconnected world. So we are at a very inflection point in a sense that while on the one hand there is that kind of fragmentation of the global economy taking place, but on the other hand you have technological developments taking place which are actually taking us in the opposite direction. How do you reconcile this is going to be the big challenge for the future. There's another critical question, uh, Mr. Saran, that I wanted to talk to you about, which is... Uh, emerges from an article that you wrote in Business Standard recently where you, you said that while on the one hand India is consol consolidating its uh, military security partnership with the US, which is all for the good, uh, to increase the security of the seas, etc. Indeed, there is a far greater cooperation uh, which is evolving uh, between the West and the East, some of the big countries in the, uh, on military security cooperation. But on the economic side, uh, there is more fragmentation. So you've argued that, that along with uh, military uh, uh, partnerships, economic partnerships should also simultaneously strengthen so that uh, the, the two strong legs make you, you know, stand firmly. So is, is there a problem there that we're not getting into economic partnerships uh, at the same, uh, with, the, with the same kind of, uh, at the same pace as uh, security partnerships, the US, which is with us uh, on security uh, uh, framework uh, is doing a trans-Pacific partnership where, which, where India is not present, and it's doing a different, uh, playing a different game there. So, so how do you reconcile these developments? Uh, well, you know, uh, um, I certainly believe that uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, a strong partnership between India and the U.S. 
uh, is in India's uh, interest. Uh, and that should be not only in terms of the security relationship, which is important, but also should extend to uh, technology partnership, uh, to economic and trade uh, partnership. Uh, because if you just focus attention on one leg of that partnership and the other leg is shaky, uh, sooner or later those contradictions will start you know, impacting. That's what your basic overall. argument yeah, is, right? Exactly. Okay. So my uh, point was that it is very important for India and the US to engage very intensively in trying to fix what is a problem on the economic and trade side. The relationship between the US and India on several trade and economic related issues is frankly adversarial. You know, I mean, take a very simple thing like APEC, you know, the Asia Pacific Indochemy Conference. Now, that is not a trade arrangement. Mm -hmm. It is a voluntary sort of uh, gathering, uh, and it is based essentially on, you know, following best practices, uh, sharing best practices, allowing a forum where business uh, people from the member countries can interact with one another. It is very, very much more a business-driven uh, body. So our uh, argument was that if India becomes a member of APEC, you know, it uh, won't have the pressure to try and, you know, uh, negotiate uh, on trade related issues. Uh, it would have a comfort level because it doesn't have to do that. And it could then conform over a period of time to the higher standards which are there in APEC. And this would be helpful in terms of it, you know, uh, India becoming part and parcel of what the US says is a higher standard you know, trading uh, arrangement. Now, even that is being opposed by the US uh, TR, you know, where other countries, most other countries uh, are in favor of India joining. So it is this kind of a, um, uh, a approach, which uh, if you talk to people in the uh, USTR or even in the in the Commerce Department, you know, India is again like as I said in the climate change negotiations. Oh, India is a disruptor. If you bring India into the APEC, uh, it may disrupt the smooth functioning of APEC. Now, that is the kind of approach which you cannot continue to have, and yet believe that you can develop a very strong, you know, political and security partnership with India. Sooner or later, this contradiction will become, uh, you know, difficult to reconcile. So it is much better that we recognize that we have a problem and we try to uh, deal with it through intensive negotiations. After all, through those intensive negotiations, we were able to overcome what was a much bigger, a more negative uh, and complex legacy like on the nuclear side. Absolutely. You know? So why can't we focus attention on this? So this is something which we will have to focus uh, attention on. Uh, the other aspect, of course, uh, we have to... What about the, uh, the other aspect of uh, how should India approach uh, China's, uh, you know, plan, larger plan to create uh, a kind of... Uh, uh, a, tra a leadership, economic leadership in the Asian region through things like One Belt, One Road, uh, even through things like uh, trying to internationalize their uh, currency attempts over the next, say, 10, 15 years in this region. Uh, so how should India uh, link up to that? Well, you know, I would uh, look at various components of China's uh, economic strategy uh, in, in, in sort of uh, not as part and parcel of a big picture, but uh, what do each one of these mean? Now, if you take internationalization of the Chinese uh, currency, there is no doubt uh, that uh, China is trying to expand. Uh, the use of the renminbi uh, internationally, globally. It has uh, certainly promoted a renminbi uh, bond market. And a lot of the, countries are falling. Uh, uh, in many countries are, are, are bringing, uh, you know, yuan into their... Uh, so falling into their sphere of influence. No, I mean, yeah. the uh, China, Chinese currency has now become part of the IMF basket. Yeah. Uh, so these are important developments. But, you know, eventually one has to ask the question, is the Chinese currency ready to become an international reserve currency in the same category as, say, the US dollar or, or the, the Euro. British pound or the Euro? The answer to that is no. Because uh, you have seen, as soon as some volatility came into the market because of even a limited degree of liberalization of the currency, there was, there was chaos. And the Chinese government brought in the controls immediately. 
it's the same thing with they have uh, a long way to go in terms of institutional exactly de so unless you have uh, relatively unrestricted capital flows where you allow the market to determine the rate of uh, the yeah. currency exactly. it is difficult to see how the internationalization of the yuan can go to its logical conclusion so will it be more liberalized yes of course will it become a more of an international currency yes will it become a international reserve currency in the category of the dollar or the euro i think that is still a very wrong and what about china's attempt to really fund uh, uh, infrastructure in a big way in this whole okay. larger so, region as far as the uh, as, as far as the to the asia infrastructure investment yes, bank the etc. investment bank and as you mentioned the one belt uh, one road uh, there also one has to be uh, rather careful in uh, assessing what the impact would be it it is a very imaginative way of presenting uh, the uh, the uh, proposal uh, especially at a time when there is huge uh, requirement for funding of infrastructure uh, in asia i mean just the sheer connectivity uh, corridors that we are talking about will require large amount of money and any chinese investment in that uh, is really welcome you know uh, so uh, once that infrastructure is created as long as china does not insist that it is has exclusive use of that architecture uh, then uh, why should uh, india have a problem with that uh, in my view the one area where we have a problem is for political reasons that is the china pakistan economic corridor because it goes through territory which is our territory keep that aside for a moment well then like, like for example if you take the chabahar port or the uh, link which is being established to afghanistan but also to other central asian countries now i see no reason why this cannot link up with the central asian eurasian corridor which china is uh, building yeah the two know. actually complement each exactly. other exactly all, uh, all the many analysts are projecting that as an opposition to well that. i don't see that as an opposition yeah. and i i think we should not look at yeah. these pros, uh, uh, these opportunities uh, in that as some um, kind of rivalry faction. between yes. this faction so and that faction so there may be areas where we can cooperate uh, like for example the bcim corridor uh, in theory at least that bcim corridor can be a very important uh, you know yeah. uh, trade and economic corridor uh, which would be beneficial for uh, northeastern india mm -hmm. so let us see which components of what china has in mind uh, can be useful to us and why not engage uh, china uh, with respect to those uh, components uh, overall with respect to uh, china's uh, strategy i think uh, we should be ready to work together with china on areas where there is a degree of convergence and we have shown that in joining the aiib uh, yeah. as you mentioned uh, brics development bank for example so i think what india has shown and i would hope that this continues <laughs> despite what has happened at the nsg yeah. that wherever we find that there are areas where china and india can work together to their mutual advantage they should work together wherever we perceive that there is a certain pressure from china or there is a certain threat to uh, india's interest from china most certainly we should you think uh, the nsg episode uh, can set back some of the ongoing economic uh, cooperation uh, i would hope not arrangements i would hope not because uh, frankly speaking in substantive terms uh, you already have a waiver from the nsg yeah. so you already have you know access to the international civil nuclear energy market uh, you know we have signed a large number of agreements so that countries. is an ongoing thing so i am not looking at uh, the nsg issue uh, as being sort of harmful to india's substantive interest it may have been a good thing for india <laughs> to be part of the nsg but it is not that if since you have not got uh, the membership somehow or the other it is limiting your access to nuclear technology or nuclear uh, supplies uh, so given that i think we should uh, we should call it a day uh, as far as soul is concerned uh, and uh, cut our losses and move on you know uh, this is not the end of the road in in that sense uh, we should continue to pursue uh, nsg membership uh, but not make it into a major issue in india china relations uh, that would not be my uh, my uh, position what about india's own uh, protectionist approach as uh, many analysts argue they say that in the last 3 4 years india has also uh, 
uh, impose uh, uh, the, probably the largest number of anti-dumping duties. India has also imposed uh, uh, barriers uh, to trade, uh, mainly protect, to protect local markets. Just as America has uh, raised 500% duty on Chinese steel. Uh, so we are going through this process where trade is, world trade is stagnant. World investment flows in the last 5-6 years have virtually halved as per data. So, uh, as we come out of this, uh, uh, wh what do you recommend uh, India should do uh, to maximize its own uh, gains vis-a-vis -vis these uh, uh, countries, big trading partners? Okay, so I go back to the argument that I made that uh, for India's own development prospects, being open to international trade, uh, being open to the global economy is something which is in the fundamental interest uh, of India. So a lot of areas to improve and a balanced approach to follow. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shamsaran, for talking to us. Uh, that's all we have uh, in this edition of State of the Economy. We'll be back with you next week. Thanks for watching.